Hey, welcome to Speechless. Glad to have you here. Live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also live over SPNN in St. Paul. And, but not live in Maplewood. <laughs> Those freaks. You know, <laughs> they just don't want you to know what's going on. And I got some valuable information from Maplewood <clears throat> as I was at a hearing this morning. Uh, because the former mayor, Diana Longry, has been charged with misdemeanor theft and misdemeanor uh, receiving stolen property and or holding on to stolen property. So, uh, interesting dynamics in the courtroom, and I just wish we could have a camera there. I mean, you, just so that you can watch it and see for yourself what's going on in the dynamic that's taking place. So you just, I don't have to be your filter, you know, in, in this deal. I can add information and tell you what's going on, <coughs> but you get to see what's taking place. You don't have to hear me describe it. You know, probably the best reason is because I don't describe things real well as, uh, as I would like to, but <coughs> that's just the way it is. So Maplewood and the courts, they just don't want you to know what's going on in their system. And it's too bad. That's not America. So, what kind of filters do you want? You know, and the only way it changes is if you speak up and if you do something about it. And you can't leave it to those who speak up. You know, and you see people speak up, you can't leave it to them. You gotta do it yourself. And it's rather fun. It's rather interesting, can be nerve-wracking, but so what? You know, do it anyway, it comes less nerve-wracking. And let, let people know where you stand and things will change. Um, so, just a couple, a couple things we're talking about on the show tonight. A lot of parental rights issue. Uh, of course, the Sandra Grazzini Rocky case, the two missing children, ABC 2020, is gonna do a show on that. Um, Friday night, tomorrow night, April 8th at 9 p.m. on ABC. You can watch the ABC's 2020 take on this, uh, what took place in this divorce case. <clears throat> and I don't know how they're going to spin it. We're going to show a little clip of it. Uh, but we're going to talk about that on our show. Uh, also, uh, an appellate court case dealing with uh, harassment restraining orders uh, that we talked about on the show showed the video of uh, the uh, order came out or the opinion these are opinions of the higher court came out and they just kind of washed it on the rug we're, we're going to talk about that or swept it under the rug <laughs> would it be washed it under the bridge you know so we're going to talk about that because uh, it's appalling how these uh, misandrist judges could care less about what's happening to, to people and you don't get your day in court. So it's, it's a problem, it's a double standard that's going on. Uh, so also the Diana Longry case, uh, before we get into that, just wanna remind everybody, um, Judicial elections in Minnesota are coming up. And people are going to sign up to run for judge. Many judges are going to go unopposed. Now, I talked about last week. So go to last week's show, youtube.com forward slash speechlessmn. And you can see last week's show where I list out the judges who are running in um, the Supreme Court. These are the current judges. A lot of people haven't declared yet. Uh, or registered to run, which doesn't happen till May. Uh, Supreme Court, Appellate Court, and the Second Judicial District. And I told people I was going to do Washington County this week, or the Tenth Judicial District, and I forgot. You know, that's kind of like walking into these courtrooms. You know, that's going to tie back in later. You know, I forgot. Can we uh, postpone the hearing? Or I didn't do the work on this that I was supposed to. Let's just you know, move it out a little further. Well, hopefully next week. Well, I don't know that I'll get to it next week as we will find out why in a bit. There's a lot going on. 
Okay, but in Wisconsin, there was a Supreme Court election that took place, and the Supreme Court judges and justices in Wisconsin, they have 10-year terms. Minnesota, six, but in Wisconsin, it's 10. Now, of course, judicial races are described as nonpartisan, which is a bunch of baloney. There are no such thing as nonpartisan races. There are called, they are called nonpartisan, but they are not nonpartisan. That's just a lie to get you to not think about what's going on. So I don't, you know, don't fall for it. Every single race is partisan. That person has issues, they're conservative, they're liberal, they're socialist, Marxist, they're big business, they're constitutionalist, they're, they have an agenda that they want to accomplish. And you need to know what that is in order to get the person that you want uh, into office. So there's no such thing as nonpartisan. And in Wisconsin, they had this race, and this um, Rebecca Bradley won the seat. And Bradley's win is going to be met by applause to the conservatives because she was running as a conservative. It had support from the prominent Republican leaders and conservative advocacy groups. Uh, they spent a lot of money on the advertising. And Kloppenberg, who got defeated, uh, drew support from liberals in Wisconsin. And you had, you know, the unions, uh, Planned Parenthood, the, the, you know, the social, uh, the liberal groups. Uh, they were supporting Kloppenberg. And whether you believe it or not, that same type of thing goes on in Minnesota. The Democrats will say, well, we don't support and endorse for office. But they let the unions, they let Planned Parenthood, they let all these other people endorse judges. And the conservatives out there don't see who's being endorsed for judge because they don't read their rags, their their papers, that type of stuff. And, and conservatives haven't picked up on, oh, this is an important issue. We need to, you know, let people know where, who we want for judge, whether they're going to follow the Constitution, what their values. Are they for life or for ripping babies apart, pulling them apart limb from limb from the womb? It goes to character. And so Wisconsin had a Supreme Court race uh, at the same time the primary was going, uh, the, uh, yeah, the primary for the presidential candidates. So that was interesting. Uh, also, boy, I went to what I used to call the 8-bit eight, eight theater, um, but now it's the 16-bit theater. Uh, but on Tuesdays it's 8-bits, um, the Plaza Theater. Eight o'clock, I was watching the 13 Hours, the Benghazi story. Uh, wow. Um, you know, I kind of consider it a mixture of Black Hawk Down and Saving Private Ryan. Uh, very graphic. Um, just a, a, just overall a sad, sad story. Um, uh, very, very emotional throughout the whole thing. Because, um, you know, Things were being set up, you know, and I thought they did a very good job at tying in relationships uh, of fathers to their kids, mothers to their kids, separation of military people from their family, uh, <clears throat> the uh, political games that go on. I, I thought it was very realistic. Uh, I mean, it was a shoot 'em up movie, you know, very graphic. Uh, I would encourage every person considering to go into the military to see that movie because it's a potential situation you will be in. And, you know, you, you hear the stories. You don't want to be left behind. We leave nobody behind. And you can't say that anymore. So you're really going to want to know what administration 
is running the program before you go into and sign up to potentially be in a battle uh, because being left behind is an option now. Not being protected is an option. So uh, they really did not get into the Hillary connection. This is really the story of the people on the ground, uh, their story about what took place, who were engaged in the battle. You didn't hear anything from you know, way, way higher ups, didn't see any of that interaction. It was just kind of like uh, the people there and then, you know, two people up the chain of command. Uh, very good movie. Uh, I think a very important movie that people need to see and should end up being a, uh, a reflection of our culture uh, and our, our military culture of the day and our administration of the day. So uh, it's at Plaza, 8 p.m. Uh, every night for a while here if you, if you want to see it. Uh, interesting news came out. Uh, taxpayers in Minnesota spent over a million dollars uh, for funding abortions. A complete violation of religious freedom and of individual ethics and the Minnesotans are being forced to pay for these abortions that they find so reprehensible. Um, and you'll hear a lot of people complain about people having to pay for the Vikings uh, that don't really want anything to do with the Vikings in building the stadium and all these sports stadiums uh, that they never will go see, they will never watch, never participate in, but they are forced to pay for these through tax dollars. And you'll hear their complaining, uh, but you won't hear the complaint about, oh, I helped pay for somebody, some mother, uh, to buy a doctor to go and rip a baby apart limb for limb. You'll hear it from me, and actually you'll hear both of those from me. Uh, it's forced association, and uh, both of uh, well, the this one is a violation of my religious beliefs, and yet I am being forced to bend to somebody other's religion, uh, secular humanism, selfishness, uh, to to pay for something that is reprehensible. Uh, but a million dollars. Uh, very close to a million dollars in, in 2014 that the taxpayers funded. And most of that increase, which is a significant increase, I forget the percentage, but most of that increase went to Planned Parenthood. <clears throat> of course, Planned Parenthood is being, is being defunded across the United States in many states uh, because of their uh, fraudulent behavior uh, bad record keeping, uh, double billing, uh, selling body parts, <laughs> a whole lot of reasons. And it just shouldn't be, you shouldn't force people to pay for something they find so reprehensible. Okay, keeping that in mind, uh, there is a hearing coming up next Tuesday morning at 8.15. It's called the Safe Bathrooms Bill. Uh, but it has to, it's House File 3396. The chief author is Representative Grunhagen. He's been on our show before, and I'm going to go down there and film that. So we may have some of that on the show next week. And it, it defines terms, okay? You know, words have jurisdiction, words have boundaries, words have meaning. Jurisdiction is key. Okay, uh, it's a key word to know in all of life. You need to know the meaning of the word law. What does law mean? Law means the relationship between things. Okay, and in law, there's jurisdictional boundaries. And once those relationships are defined or we know what those relationships are, there's a boundary set. And so words have boundaries, like the, of, a, uh, those have boundaries. They, there's a meaning given to those so that people can communicate to each other 
and have a conversation so we understand what, it, what people are saying. And it's very difficult sometimes to define those boundaries. But boundaries are there. Boundaries are, at least in the scientific realm, in the engineering realm, uh, more appropriately, are easier to define. And they may not be easier to define, but once defined, they're pretty much set. You know, you, you're not going to change the boundaries of what gravity means um, unless you apply the, the laws of lift and thrust. You know, and, and then that will change gravity, but the law is still there and it's complete. So, and, and we understand what that means. So the same thing with words. And in this safe bathrooms bill, um, what we're going to do is it's going to define a person's sex as biological. It's going to clarify that traditional sexual identity or sexual orientation may not overwrite another person's right to privacy based on biological sex. And that's, that's what's happening a lot all across the nation where you have these transgender bathrooms, unisex bathrooms, and what's happening is people, guys claiming to be women, are going into these restrooms and actually they end up being voyeurs and, and filming and, and you don't have the right to violate another person's privacy just because you say you're a different sex than you are. Reserves employers restrooms, locker rooms, and dressing rooms for males or females. Prohibits public schools and universities from allowing access to restrooms, locker rooms, and dressing rooms to students except on the basis of biological sex. So it has a lot to do um, with those issues. It's a big battle because here in Minnesota things are falling apart and people are being abused because of this uh, we don't know who we are uh, laws that we have. All right, we got a phone call here. So uh, caller, you got a comment or question? Jim Kinley. Hey. I found this uh, television station many years ago. Uh, wow, well, you have a good show because you really discuss the issues in depth and detail. Thank so you. I wondered why in Maplewood have they banned you because they don't like to have the conversation. The other thing I got to ask you is in Maplewood, I noticed the police chief who runs the uh, Human Civil Rights Commission or Human Rights Commission, whichever he wants to call it. And yeah. I even question whether he should be uh, uh, running it based upon his record. But is he, is, is, I noticed that the last two months he's canceled it, I guess, canceled it because oh, really? he didn't get the member. He canceled it in February, he's canceled it in March, well, or in April. I guess uh, it might have actually been three months. But he did cancel the meeting that they were to have, uh, I think, just last Monday. So, I, you okay. know, my question to you is, uh, have you presented to the uh, some of this information from the Human Rights, uh, Human Civil Rights Commission up in Maplewood? Do talk you, about? Uh, do you, do you want me to? The discussion? And uh, he probably would be an expert of what goes on in high schools. And what is the law in the state of Minnesota on this in high schools now? And do Are the high schools... Uh, under state law to do have to follow a certain procedure or is that something that's on the uh, docket on the agenda up at the state of minnesota thank you yeah thank you caller uh sorry you can't see the show in maplewood anymore <clears throat> that's kind of a jurisdictional boundary issue <laughs> there that uh they don't want uh they don't want you to hear them redefine things and and take your um uh, and spend your money on projects that they don't want you to know what they're spending it on and so they just take it from you and they don't want to hear any kickback and any uh, you guys uh, you should be thinking about doing something else um, so no I haven't been to the Human Rights Commission and it is interesting that they're not meeting uh, whether the members are showing up or not uh, but folks uh, you need to show up you know, and you need to make your comments known. And maybe talk, contact organizations and, and have them give you a script to read, you know, for two minutes or three minutes, depending on the time you have, or, you know, um, get your message across. They need to know and they need to hear opposition to what they're doing. 
and I don't know the current law on this, except that the uh, sports, uh, Minnesota Sports Commission or whatever, they decided that uh, boys can, who think they're girls can play on um, uh, girls' teams and vice versa. Girls who think they're boys can play on boys' teams. And I think it's the same with the restrooms. Uh, so, and what's happened in that case, I know in St. Paul, uh, one school lost uh, at least 42 students. The parents pulled their kids out of grade schools because they were supporting this uh, gender bathroom issue, uh, the gender confusion bathroom issue. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. We don't hear a lot about it, and I need to do more research on it. And that's why I'm going to be down at the hearing Tuesday morning at 8.15 in the basement of the state office building and, and filming that uh, to get a better understanding of what's going on and what, what the legislators are thinking. So it will be a very interesting hearing. Okay. Um, and, and I bring up the bathroom bill in relationship to... Um, the federal government is really saying that, you know, you as a parent, you are equal partners with us. You know, we're, we're going to let you be equal partners with the government in raising your children. You hear the tone in that, the, uh, just saying that, you know, we're going to, you know, it, the tone should be the other way around. Okay, parents, you're the parents. Uh, we'll help you as you desire us to help you. Um, but it's the other way around. No, we'll let you be equal partners with us. Because right now we're superior and we want you to be equal partners. And, and that's just backwards uh, recognition. And it's interesting because many states are are uh, fighting back on this uh, parental rights issue and actually trying to support more parental rights where the parents have the authority over the state. And uh, according to uh, parentalrights.org, who's pushing a constitutional amendment to the United States Constitution that would make parental rights a fundamental right, uh, different states are doing different things and the legislature in Virginia passed a bill uh, that would mandate that Virginia schools notify parents if a student's required reading includes sexually explicit material. But this bill was vetoed by uh, Terry McAuliffe, the governor, and I guess they're going to try go for a veto override. Um, it's just common sense. I mean, really, you, you safeguard your parental rights, and it's the parents who need to safeguard their children. And if the school is going to put in questionable sexual material, the parents have a right to know about it. And so with the governor vetoing this common sense legislation, um, you know, it, it, I mean, what, what's he thinking? You know, but this is, again, the mindset. The government, we are the parent. We will tell you what your kids need to know and, and, and learn. And you, you know, maybe we'll let you be an equal partner, <laughs> but I don't think it's that way. Um, so the governor declared in a statement uh, that local school boards are most knowledgeable and best positioned to decide what texts are appropriate uh, for the children. And so having a parent direct the education of the child, it's just, uh, it's just not there, Wh which has a lot to say about the education system itself. If by the time you come out and you're 18 and you've gone through all those years of the educational system and you're not able to parent or you're not smart enough, um, what does that tell you about the school system? You know, uh, it, it, it should be better than that. There should be the realistic understanding of what it takes to parent and to live in the, in, in the world. 
um, but our education, educated people know, or, or at least they portray, that parents aren't smart enough. And if there's a reason they're not smart enough, it goes right back to that education system. <laughs> you know, uh, that's the fallacy of their 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 logic, that the state knows better. Okay, well, it's the state that's teaching everybody. Okay, um, you know, and and this kind of mindset goes through all things: the doctor's office, courthouse, local schools. Everyone seems to think that a degree or a license or maybe just a popular election has made them more of an expert on your child than you are. And you just see that with a lot of people. I know better for your child than you. So anyway, that's a big problem in our society and parents. You better start speaking up uh, or they're going to run you over. Okay, quickly here. Uh, I want to talk about the Diana Longry court case today where she's being charged with misdemeanor theft and misdemeanor receiving stolen property or holding on to stolen property. And it was a pretrial, which means you go in there in the courtroom and arrange your uh, affairs, try to, you know, move on to the next step of whether we're going to have a trial, you can plead guilty, you can come to an agreement. Um, but in this case, Diana Longry, well, an interesting thing was happening. The, the judge sitting there, Judge Kyle, who is up for election, he was appointed by Dayton here recently. He's up for election, but he is moving off the Maplewood block of cases. So, because this if there was a trial, he would be off the block by the time the trial happened. They had to go do another, they have to go do another pre-trial. But uh, Diana Longry, former Mayor Maplewood, put in a motion to have the prosecutor changed. And this is kind of a, it's kind of a new thing. Um, and my understanding is that there are no rules and regulations in Minnesota to remove a prosecutor for bias and you know you can kind of look into the aspect of um, lawyers are to conduct themselves professionally there's uh, prof lawyers professional responsibility board they have a code of ethics judges have a code of ethics and you can look at it that way as one aspect but the reasons that Diana Longry is challenging uh, the prosecutor is because the prosecutor, the prosecutory law firm, I think it was Kelly and Levin, and maybe at that time, now it's Kelly and Fawcett, I believe, um, I may have those reversed, um, was the prosecutor for the city of Maplewood when Diana Longry was mayor. And <clears throat> in the affidavit that, and I don't have it here, that uh, that was written, uh, it talked about the adversarial relationship that Diana Longry had with the prosecuting, t uh, prosecuting firm for Maplewood and that the prosecutor was leaking information to the press about Maplewood. And there's a client uh, relationship, client-attorney relationship, but the attorney is being suggested was leaking information. Uh, to the press about what was taking place in Maplewood and before the city council would know about it. And there's a number of other issues going on there, uh, but, you know, that, that's, some, that's some bad blood. And, of course, Melinda Coleman, now the city, count, uh, city manager, was part of the uh, staff and didn't like Diana Longry. Uh, at the time, and Diana, and so now as the city manager is now telling the prosecutory firm to go after her. Understand that when Diana Longry brought out to the law firm that, hey, you guys, you're 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 giving away our secret information to the press, okay? Um, it's not being disclosed to us. You're disclosing it to the press. You know what? That's an ethics violation. How can we trust you? And very shortly thereafter, 
The prosecutorial firm of uh, Kelly and Lemon, I believe at the time, resigned from a $300,000 contract. I understand that? They resigned. But also in that game, the uh, city manager at the time had worked out an agreement with the law firm, uh, the prosecutorial law firm, that if they got fired or if they left, there'd be a bonus for them for leaving. But that contract had never been signed with by the city council or approved by the city council. And it has to be. And so Kelly and Lemons, the law firm, said, hey, we're resigning. Okay, we resigned today, but we want our bonus money. And of course, that did not take place. <laughs> So you have this law firm that is out to get Diana Longry. You have a city manager, in my opinion, that's out to get Diana Longry. And here's Maplewood spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year uh, of your money on a waste, on a, uh, uh, a building, a athletic building, a swimming place, a theater place, a community center that's losing hundreds of thousands of dollars every year and some years millions of dollars and they want to come after Diane Longry and spend thousands of dollars doing it for $25 theft that they say took place that really didn't take place. See this is a political witch hunt in my opinion and uh, they're going to try to prove their point and it's going to cost them a lot of money and I guarantee you in the end they'll lose on this one because they don't know the law and they think people will cave. And, and what happened, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the current civil lawyer for uh, Maplewood, oh, I'm just drawing a blank, he used to be the prosecutorial lawyer and he went out and he was forced to... Uh, prosecute citizens of Maplewood that didn't stand a chance but because the city council members like Kathleen Judiman wanted to go after certain people in the city they said do it anyway you know even though the lawyer knew I don't have a chance so then he doesn't win these cases and then they fire him from that job basically because he didn't win them because they thought he did a bad job but the law wasn't on their side <laughs> so Anyway, um, what was interesting, though, the prosecutor could have stepped aside. And what happened in the court case uh, today, the judge had a discussion about it, said we're going to have to do a new pretrial, but left it open for the prosecutor to do the right thing and say, hey, you know what, we're going to get another law firm from another city to come in and do this prosecution. And, and the prosecutor, Martin uh, Nodair, uh, he said, you know, no, this, you know, we're, we're going to be fair. There's no rules about getting rid of a prosecutor. There's no case law. Nothing's been cited. Well, there, there isn't any. It's a first impression. The, the court hasn't dealt with this issue in Minnesota. Now they will. So just because it hasn't been dealt with before doesn't mean it doesn't get to get dealt with. And, and, but these lawyers and these judges will use it, oh, we've never dealt with this before. We can't make a decision on our own. No, that's your job to do that. Anyway, so it's postponed till later, May 12th, and we'll see what happens. It will go before a different judge. All right, <clears throat> let's go to the... Uh, Sandra Grazzini Rocky case, the two missing children, and ABC is going to have a story on that. Uh, and so let's get that video ready. ABC 2020 tomorrow night at 9 o'clock will be showing this uh, show about these two missing girls and describing the divorce case that went on. Now, what I don't know, I, I you know, the only thing I've seen of the show is this 20, about 20 second clip that I'm going to show you that you can see on their website. And for, you know, for me, in order for this show to be a success, they're going to need to have at least five minutes on 
the judge's behavior, Judge David Knudsen, and how he has just totally botched this case and brought in a lot more trauma to this family than is necessary. All right, but we're going to watch the uh, preview, or the trailer, or whatever to the show tomorrow night at 9 o'clock on ABC. So let's watch it. This is a lovely, peaceful place, but it's in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. There are two teenage girls from a big city, and to be plopped down here must have been a huge culture shock. This is the middle of nowhere, but you'd be surprised how many people come from here. <laughs> was it a secret that the girls were here? No. No, it was not. So you didn't, like, say, okay, go hide in the back bedroom when somebody's no. pulling up? Everybody knew they were here. You made no effort to conceal them? Mm -hmm. No. No, they, they had been in public, they had been out shopping, they were in the, you know, the hair salon they in They went LA. to church with us. And they actually, went by their, no, their first names, Samantha and Gianna. Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually they knew, um, the, the waitresses at the little cafe knew their orders by heart because they ordered the same thing every time. All right. Uh, what, I forgot to set this up, but basically that's the two couple, that's the couple that um, had the kids at their ranch, uh, Sam and Gianna, at their ranch um, for these three years, approximately, uh, taking care of the kids. They're out in public. Uh, social workers were there. Um, and so that was their story. What, what I find very interesting, you, you, you know what it's about. Hey, you, you don't, you're, you're still on trial. You got your court case coming up. And my understanding is everybody that's been involved in this case, whether it's Sandra Grazini Rucky, the mother, the Didi Evavold who took the kids to, to the place with uh, Sandra, as far as I understand, and the, the family here who uh, had the kids at this ranch for abused children, <coughs> they all are talking. <laughs> they all said, yeah, I did that. Well, why would they do that? Why wouldn't their attorneys tell them, shut up? You know, uh, I, and I, I just find that amazing that they haven't. Well, if you read the statute they're charged under 609.26, it's, uh, it's a felony to deprive parental rights, custodial rights. And there's a number of sections in there, descriptions of the potential ways <laughs> and kidnapping is one of them. But the issue here is, and what people and what the press is failing to understand, is that these kids ran away from home. Okay, so they should be charged under something about receiving runaway children. Uh, but the children were also free to go, so there wasn't any kidnapping going on. The children could have gone anywhere. They were out in public. People knew they were there. Social workers knew they were there at the house. The other thing that took place, um, uh, the other thing about the law and why I think they'll win this case is because the law gives an out for anybody to take a child from anyone who, who has custody over that child and it could be even the state. So if you see the state abusing a child, of course the state has to abuse a child through a person, if you see that happen, you have every right to go and take custody and take that child out of that abusive situation. And the law protects you. Okay, so I think that's going to be their defense when it actually comes to trial. So um, that's why I think they're talking. We did nothing wrong. We followed the law. There is an abusive situation. And, and what I see that happen, you know, when I read these articles here, nobody talks about the law and how it works. And, and, and I think that's kind of like what happens with the Maplewood City Council. You know, there's kind of a, a perception of what the law is. And, or I want it to be a certain way, and since it didn't happen my way uh, or the way I think it's supposed to happen, uh, I want these people charged. Well, when you actually go then and read the law, you find out, oh my goodness, there's an out. What they did wasn't wrong. 
uh, th people can do certain things that you wouldn't expect them to be able to do. And that's the case with these, these girls that went missing. Um, so, and, and really, you know, the Lakeville police, they did not go looking for these girls until uh, the Star Tribune, uh, oh, Dahl, Dahl is his last name, and then Michael Broadcore uh, brought up the, the, the story and, and pushed it. Then the Lakeville police felt the pressure because Sandra, even though the story is she went to the ranch, dropped the girls off, uh, that's what they mentioned in the, uh, I think in the video there. They dropped the girls off with Dee Dee Evervold. Um, they, 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 they went there, um, but the Lakeville police never searched for them. And Sandra even asked the Lakeville police to go look for them, you know. So the other thing that comes out in the story is that uh, what I hear a lot is the judge is saying, or the press is saying, the judge has said there was a hearing on the, on the uh, whether abuse had taken place, and the judge, David Knudsen, had found that there was no abuse. Well, you got to understand, these weren't hearings. These were, they didn't even take very much time. I, I know we were at, I was at Diana Longrie's hearing today in, in reference. That was probably about a 10-minute discussion that took place, okay? And you know what? The, the court case, and I've read the transcript and the document of whether there was abuse, was about 15 minutes. Evidence wasn't allowed to be brought in. Tape recordings were not, of gunshots were not allowed to be played. Uh, and, and the judge heard things and heard testimony from the girls back in his courtroom from the children saying, no, we will not go back to our dad. We won't do that. He's abusing us. And the judge said, told them, this is my, from what I understand, yes, you will go back and uh, I'll force you to do it. And so when that happened, the judge then, neither parent had custody at the time, and uh, the judge forced them to go back, live with their um, actually live with their aunt and they didn't want to live with their aunt so not uh, because it would mean they would have to go back into the relationship with their dad and so they took off they running and that's when they went off to the, the the farm well you know what this is this whole process has not been fair to anybody in the, in, not fair to Sandra Grazzini, not fair to David Ruckey, not fair to the children. And the reason it has been fair is because the court has been trying to short circuit this and trying to, we don't want to do the hearings, we don't want to hear the evidence, I just want to make a decision. I've already predetermined what my decision is going to be, so I'm going to do it and try to get everything short and out of here and let's go. And so parental rights are being denied. The state is saying, I'm the parent you know, uh, and so we're not going to give you your rights. I can't tell you how many times, at least four times that I know of, where Sandra was not allowed to be at hearings where she can defend herself, where she can talk to her an attorney. And the time that she lost her custody of her kids uh, by this psychologist that says she was dangerous, the whole transcript, the psychologist only had a 30-minute conversation with Sandra. That's it, ever. And he made this determination that parental alienation was going on. I know how this system works, this, the psychologist works. You know, they're just in the game. Give me a check, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make a decision. They, they, could, they make decisions in 10 minutes. I've been through that process. I know what they do. Uh, it, it, it's a scam. So this psychologist, you know, it's a 30-minute conversation where he only has about five minutes of the conversation. Sandra was not on the phone. It was a phone conversation. It wasn't in court. Witnesses weren't called. The psychologist couldn't be cross-examined. And so Sandra loses custody of the kit. She wasn't there. 
and her attorney didn't defend her, didn't say a thing. Whatever the psychologist said, he just rambled on and her attorney didn't defend her at that time. It was not Michelle McDonald at that time. Michelle McDonald's trying to defend Sandra, but the court is putting up obstacles uh, for that process to take place, including arresting Michelle McDonald while uh, she <clears throat> uh, is trying to defend her and making her defend, San making Michelle McDonald defend Sandra Grazzini Rocky uh, without her glasses, without her shoes, sitting in a wheelchair and handcuffed to the wheelchair. Not handcuffed, but she thinks she's, she's cuffed to the wheelchair from the back end. Um, and without her client. So her client wasn't there again. And the judge said, you better continue on with this, but Your Honor, my client's not here, my paperwork's not here because you took it, you gave everybody an impression that I'm arrested and the case is done for the day. And just says, you know, it's gonna be a default judgment if you don't uh, pursue on. You know, well, David Knudsen, the judge, set all that up with the false arrest you know, for taking a picture in a courtroom when court wasn't in session. Arrested and spending the night overnight for a paper ticket, you know, it's kind of like a citation, it's kind of like, you know, an expired parking meter. You know, we're going to arrest you uh, and take you away because you parked at an expired meter. Your meter expired. You know, I mean, it's outrageous what they did to uh, Michelle McDonald. Well, Sandra wasn't there again to defend herself. And so Sandra's out doing her job as an airline stewardess. They go out and arrest, they go out, get the U.S. Marshals to arrest her based on some federal charges, and there were none. So the Lakeville police was lying to the federal marshals. Well, coming back, and once she's back in town, she has a court case, and the judge proceeds in the court case. They change the time to an earlier time, and Sandra wasn't there again because they changed the time. And then another time, she had another court case shortly thereafter, and they changed the time again, and she wasn't there. So at her bail hearing, she wasn't there. And understand, the charge here is such a low charge that it's less of a charge than drunk driving. Now, if you're first time drunk driving, you know what the charge is? I mean, it's gonna be your time in jail, stayed, you know, you may get 30 days in jail, or, or um, uh, if you get drunk again during uh, the next 90 days. And, well, today we're in the courtroom, $200 fine, okay? Deprivation of parental rights is less than that. It can be more, but first time violation, time served, well, they don't even arrest you on it. They, I mean, and first of all, it's very, very hard to get any prosecutor from any city to go or any county to go and charge anybody with deprivation of parental rights. It is very, very difficult. They just don't do it. They will do everything in their power to push you away, and that's why these kids weren't searched for by the Lakeville police for all this time because they were pushing both parents away. Where are my kids? Where are my kids? You know, even though it looks like Sandra knew where they were, um, Lakeville was saying, you know, we're not doing anything about it. You know, because they don't deal with it. And so we got a bail hearing. You have a constitutional right to be there. And they have the bail hearing uh, which was scheduled before David Knutson, and, and during that morning it got switched to another. David Knutson asked another judge to go on to the case. <laughs> okay, didn't go through the proper channels of assigning a new judge. A different judge goes on there, gives a million dollar bail for something that requires no bail. Just show up at the next hearing. And of course, the prosecutors out there are lying. She's a flight risk. She was in this other city. You know, no, she was on her job. Okay, everybody knows she was a 
uh, she's not a flight attendant, not a she's a flight attendant. She's not a stewardess, but they know they know where she was. They know how to find her. It wasn't a problem, okay. But they gave her this big flight risk thing. Still, she wasn't there for the hearing, okay. And so then later on, they have another hearing that's scheduled for like ten, eleven o'clock, and it's on the calendar. It shows the time. And then it got switched to 9 o'clock, and they had it without her attorney or her present again. I mean, what's going on? I mean, this is, I'm doing another thing. I, I'm, I'm working on another project on looking at felons who voted, I'm going through Ramsey County right now. And the court records are terrible. Uh, I mean, I think some are good. I think the information is accurate. Of course, on their website it says don't rely on the information, but the records are really, really, really bad, <laughs> especially the older ones. But uh, anyway, so Sandra Grazini, Rocky, um, she uh, that's what's going to be on 2020. If you don't hear anything about what I just talked about know that the fix is in on this show. There's just no way that you shouldn't know about what the judge and the judges have done in this case. And there's a lot more to it. But I'm going to be able to, after the show, I will have an interview. Uh, well, we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, with Sandra Grazini Rucky and with Michelle McDonald and get their input of what they thought about the TV show and I will be able to play clips next week. So um, that would be an exclusive. Of course, you and Maplewood, you won't get to see it because your city council members don't want you to see public access TV. Okay, uh, so that gets us then to the issue of child support in the Sandra Grazzini Rocky case. Uh, you're in jail, how do you pay child support? And this is a situation that happens to everybody that's in jail that has child support to pay. And in order for your child support to go down, because you're not making an income, you have to file a motion with the court. And, uh, and that has happened. And then you have to get an evidentiary hearing. And so you're trying to get your child support stayed. You know, you've been working and in this case, the court said Sandra Grazzini Rocky could make a whole lot more money than she's making, but the airlines has fixed that for her. I mean, they've kind of set what her level is and how much she can fly, and then especially with all this court stuff going on. So we have, we have a record of her income over the last five years as to what it is. Well, the court ignored her income level. It said, you can make more. And she's going in arguing, how can I make more? Because the airlines won't let me make more. And if you put these restrictions on me, I'll make even less. So they set the, her child support at a level that was, uh, you know, after taxes, after health insurance, which she had to pay all of it, after a whole lot of things, she had to, she, she got minus on her checks, okay? There, there's no money coming home, okay? So how does that work? How do you live? You, you don't. And in this case, Sandra Grazzini was going from home to home and friend to friend and finding a place to live. And um, so she's going in court to get her child support stopped because she's not making any income because in order to be out on bail, they set the restriction that you as a airline stewardess, you have to tell us your schedule and, and, and where you're going to be. Well, TSA makes that impossible to do. Airlines cannot release the schedules of their staff, and, and they don't do that anyway. <laughs> as to what flight they're going to be on, when, that puts the flight and the crew at risk. Okay, kind of everybody knows this flight's going to leave from uh, Minneapolis to Dallas. You know, they're going to do it on an everyday, but they don't do the flight crew. And they don't release that information out to the public. 
and uh, the probation said you got to not only give over your passport, you um, so no longer are you flying to Canada or, or other places, international flights. Um, so anyway, the airlines ended up just saying, okay, we're putting you on leave because we can't deal with this. We got hundreds of thousands of employees. We can't deal with this situation just for you. And uh, so now she's not making income and the court's trying to say, well, you can go out and, and get another job, but you still have to pay 1300 a month in child support, you know, uh, and, and, and good luck. You've been a stewardess or a flight attendant for 30 some years. You know, and this is the this happened to really a whole lot of men in the tech industry when you had the tech bubble and people were spending money for the technology things and these guys were making 120 good money and guess what the industry stopped. Okay, so with the stopping of the industry, their incomes went down to 40,000, and so their wives started divorcing these men because they lost their income. But the judges were going out and said, well, you're making 40. You, you Just last year made 120. You got to pay child support on 120,000, but you're only making 40. How are you going to make it? You, you're not. That, that's the bottom line. You're not going to make it. Well, fortunately, they stayed the child support, but there's a, other games that went on in the place. Uh, but the child support can change retroactively to January 1st and they can just, the court will change it if they want to. So what do you do? You're stuck. All right. See you next week this time. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. Uh, God bless. See you next week.